Welcome to episode number 116 of the Marine Layer podcast. We welcome on Mariners broadcaster Ryan Roland Smith, a chat about baseball in Australia, his time as a broadcaster with the Mariners, and a couple of stories from his playing days. We also have our two Mariners storylines from the first handful of games. Here's your guys' reminder. If you're listening to the show, do us a big favor. Download these episodes. Leave us that five-star review. Leave a written review, too. Tell us what you like, what you like hearing, what you might want to hear more of, all that stuff. If you're listening and watching on YouTube, hit that big red subscribe button. It's free. It takes about a second to do. Like, comment, and subscribe all across YouTube. And check us out on social media, too. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube Shorts at Marine Layer Pod. Let's get it rolling. The pitch from Acevedo. A drive deep to right field. Down the line. The Mariners win this game 2-1. The dream lives. They're going to the playoffs. One more from Gant. There you go. Left field. We got a tie ball game. Oh, yeah. Oh, baby, what a moment. Tie ball game at 7-7. And we welcome you to this episode of the Marine Layer Podcast, part of the Just Baseball Podcast Network. Recording post game here on Monday, April 1st. Wow, how was it to be back at the ballpark? It looked pretty nice. Jealous? Question mark? Uh, yeah, a little jealous. I'm I'm not gonna lie, a little jealous. Well, you should have you should have made your way up, Hoss. Well, I I I need to I need to allocate time to come up. So that's fair. Uh, I'll yeah, uh, but it was- soon. Soon. It was it was great. Like honestly, being there both as a fan and and getting back to doing some media stuff too. Yeah, it's it's all great. Arizona was a bunch of fun as we've talked about, but to actually get in the flow of the regular season, awesome. Like to see the vibe around the ballpark, people were fired up on opening night. Yeah, it's been it's been great. And there was very, very good reason to be fired up about this team as we've talked about. I am a little disappointed though in your intro today, because it's the first show we've done. After the start of the regular season, you only get one chance a year, a year to do this. And you didn't do it. You didn't start the show with seasons over. Yeah. I know you wanted me to do that. It's the, it's the, it's the South park thing with, with, uh, or no family guy thing with Stevie at the Mets game. Sorry. I get my cartoons mixed up. You're, I mean, you're still not getting it right. It's it's not Stevie. Who? The, the character's name and family guy is Stewie. Damn. Did you watch that? Not a knower. Did you watch None that ever. little Family Guy in South Park growing up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Opening day, here's the first Hot pitch. Hot seat me. Yeah. Here's the first pitch, and the season's over. Well, if you read some of our replies on the live stream on Sunday, I think some people thought that. And, you know. <laughs> Dude. People are, people are welcome to have that opinion. Like, I want to know what goes on in these people's heads. I don't know if they're trolling or if they genuinely mean the things they say when they're just firing off these outlandish takes four games into the season. It it really the, is remarkable. Really, the fact there are some people out there who think Dom Canzone should be playing in Korea <laughs> after the first now five games of the season just... It blows my mind. Before we actually get into some of the negative stuff, Lyle, I just want to give a shout out that, you know, I heard all this stuff secondarily through you because I'm down here in Oregon for opening weekend and you're up there at the ballpark. Everyone who came to say hello, like shout out to you guys. I mean, that's awesome. I hear hear all of this, all this reception that Lyle was able to garner for us up at the ballpark. This is that, that, it's not the coolest thing ever. Like it just, it's just awesome that you guys are able to come out and say hello and show some face. And it, and it really does mean a lot to for you guys to go do that. Yeah, it means the world to us. I will say, like, I feel very odd being on the receiving end of it. Because, like I always say, like, who in the world are we? We're just two dudes who are friends who like to talk about the Mariners. But the fact people really enjoy it, yeah, it really hits home to the both of us. So we appreciate it a ton. I really appreciate the creativity. We had one fan who came up to us. Like, most everybody was very nice. And most people just came up and, you know, said, love the show and love all your content. I always love watching it. We had one fan while I was out in the pen doing some fan content yell out to us. And, and she said, Babe Ruth's not real. And I said, you know, that's creativity right there. Shout out to you guys. Like, if, if you guys can think of witty things to yell out to us, like, like you're only going to win more brownie points with the two of us. That was that was a lot of fun. That's certainly a lot of fun. And there is a lot more time for a lot more fun as the season goes along. 
Let's get to our Mariners storylines. Up first, Lyle, the Mariners uh, in the first series of the season, they could not hit spin. It looked a whole lot like last year when they were facing the Red Sox up there, junking it up with sweepers and sliders and cutters and sinkers and curveballs and splitters. And the Mariners couldn't hit any of it. And they struck out. 45 times in four games to just six walks against the Red Sox. Is there reason for concern? No, because it's four games into the year. We talked about this a little bit on the live stream, which if those of you listening to the podcast don't know this, we'll give ourselves a little bit of a plug right here. Now, every Sunday night at 7 p.m. going forward, TJ and I are going live on Instagram and YouTube to basically take any questions you guys have, interact with you guys, just more ways to you know, build some connections within like the Mariner fan base and just answer questions people have. So if you want live reactions to things, go check out our live streams every Sunday at 7 p.m. But we talked about on those live streams that, yeah, it's it's too early in the season to be doing this. Yes, for the four games they played, it was it was suboptimal to see all the swing and miss at all the breaking balls because those were similar issues to what we saw last year. Ryan Divish wrote a story about this in the Seattle times. The Red Sox knew exactly what they were doing entering this series. Listen to what Garrett Whitlock did on Sunday. For example, do through 83 pitches, 23 of them were two seamers. AK. Those are the only fastballs he threw of the 83 pitches. He threw 23 were two seam fastballs. He threw 25 changeups, 15 sliders, 13 sweepers, and five cutters. The Red Sox knew exactly what they were doing entering this series. So yes, for the first series, it is nobody's cheering about the fact they were striking out a bunch. But this is still a roster that has been constructed to rid themselves of strikeouts. This is a roster with a team that is going to punch out a lot less. It just happened to occur in the first four games of the year. So like, look at what happened on Monday. It was only five strikeouts. It went way down. I'm not saying there's not going to be games where they don't strike out. Every team does. But for is there reason for concern overall? No. Do I wish they hadn't struck out that many times in the first four games? Yes. Not not reason for concern yet. I mean, you're right. The Red Sox knew exactly what they were doing in that first series. You you just used the Sunday start for for Garrett Whitlock. Well, the entire series... uh, their pitchers through 11% four seam fastballs. <laughs> the whole the whole pitching staff, one out of every 10 pitches was a four seam fastball. If that doesn't tell you a game plan, I don't know what does. And it couldn't be more polar opposite here on Monday where Tristan McKenzie's like a 50 to 60% fastball guy and his velo's down like four miles an hour. So when Dom Canzone gets 91 miles an hour on the top rail of the strike zone, it's a little bit better than constant sweepers against the Red Sox and you know I'll I'll give them credit we've talked to a couple Red Sox people who say you know kind of like the 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 Red Sox pitching attack of what they've what they've sort of brought in in the offseason what they've been tweaking with and it certainly worked for uh it, it worked for one one series the other big thing about that first series with this lineup there's no Mitch Garver like Mitch Garver is supposed to be in there have a league average strikeout rate above average power it's going to walk at an above league average weight rate as well and he wasn't there like that's a, that's a, almost an improper way to an, uh, evaluate a lineup it, it certainly is we saw a couple things that i think were actually like very positive i thought jorge polanco had a bunch of good at bats within that series and you know w- we got hammered with questions all offseason about is julio clutch is julio going to be clutch and yeah he was clutch yeah, he was clutch. He did his job. He went up there, the game on the line, a couple times. He walked the first time in game number one, and then game number three walked it off. And that's what you want to see. He was patient, waited for his pitch, came to him, and he made him pay. And it, and it worked out. Yeah, and you're seeing him lay off a lot of the pitches that he was swinging at last year. Again, it's only been four games. We'll see how it plays out through the course of 162. But it's a pretty good sign. He didn't look like he was pressing. He didn't look like he was overmatched. He was pretty relaxed in those situations, and it led to some very positive results. So overall, a couple more lineup notes that uh, that I noticed that uh, that are going to change, but I think these are like the, the biggest areas that are going to change as the team moves forward. I mean, we talked so much about of adjustments. They didn't OPS under 400 the second time through the lineup in that first series, which 
I, I heard Rick bring it up today again when I was listening on the radio, and Rick was like, "Hey, listen, like, listen to how this lineup operates." They had that start, they had the outing against uh, Yamamoto in spring training, where he carved him up the first time through. They came back out with a sec, uh, the second time through with a game plan, and they knocked him around. Well, they didn't do that against the Red Sox. Like three ninety three OPS is uh, that would be a good on base percentage, but not a good OPS. So that was innings four through six. That was their OPS. I qualify the second time through, but it's close. second to third time through the lineup is innings four through six. And then three ball counts against the Red Sox. Damage counts. They were four for 23 with zero extra base hits, 14 strikeouts, and six walks on those counts. By the way, the ratio, the league ratio last year on three ball counts was about a two to one walk to strikeout ratio, and the Mariners was flipped. So it wasn't very good. Uh, not good in damage counts, not good second time through the lineup, and overall, flat out, just not good enough for, for, for a series. But thankfully, only a series, and not we're not talking about April and May in the sample size. Does the Red Sox pitching get some credit for this? I'm sure the cold weather plays some factor into it, but for example, I was pretty blown away with how dominant Nick Pavetta looked in that game start that he made Nick Pavetta is about a three or four starter at least that's who he's been throughout his career he's fine he's not somebody you're gonna jump for joy over but he looked like he was just carving right through that lineup because he was like that didn't look like a four starter that was pitching in that game against the Mariners so I don't know if Andrew Bailey I mean a lot of Red Sox people seem to be praising Andrew Bailey a lot who's now the Red Sox pitching coach for allegedly some of the work he's done with this pitching group but yeah, for a rotation we expected to be pretty middle of the league in terms of production, it didn't look like that in the first series. Pavetta pitched that well because I picked him up in fantasy. So that's why. <laughs> I, had, I, I had a really good fantasy weekend, and it just had to work out that way. I thought everything you do fantasy-wise and betting-wise just goes to shit. Oh, I'm good at fantasy. Well, actually, you, yeah. you know who stands on the podium alone at the top in our college fantasy league? You know. Okay, I keep sorry. reminding you. Let me let me retract my statement. Fantasy, Just fantasy football and and sports, you're much better. Yeah, gambling's where you run into your problems. When there is just direct money involved, that's when you run into problems. Your two dollar bets that don't win you two dollars and fifty cents. Yeah, but Nick Pavetta, when I pick him up off waivers, ooh. ooh, ooh. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I mean, I think the Red Sox pitching actually does deserve some credit. I don't think the Mariners are going to look like that all all season by any stretch. In fact, like you just mentioned, here on Monday, looked much cleaner. Yes, McKenzie's velo was a little bit down, but they still had a much better approach. They still didn't look overmatched. It was much better. It's a start. Yeah, it's a, it start. a start. Let's let's uh, uh, a full series. By the end of this series, we'll have a. It, it'll be a better evaluation, but as I said on the stream in totality, I mean, it's going to need to be till June, like yeah. June by the time we can actually say this, uh, uh, either this offense has a problem or this offense is a problem. Those are the two forks we'll, we will cross on June 1st. Mark it down. Before we get to our second storyline, let's talk to you guys about a place we love to hang out during Mariners games when we're not at the ballpark. What do we love to do? Well, we love to head over to Pagacha's Pub 85. That's over in Kirkland. It's a great place to go spend some time with your friends. You can have some great value drinks during happy hours, some great food. You want to play darts. You want to watch the Mariners games. You can do all that stuff. If you get there early during happy hour, again, cash in on some great drink specials. You want to get there for a happy hour and then stay for the Mariners game. You can get some happy hour drinks in beforehand. It's a pretty good recipe for a good time. That includes... $3 $3 domestic beers, $4 Manny's, and $4 Blue Moons, $4 Mac and Jacks, $4 Wells, and $4 House Wines. Those happy hours are 2 to 6 p.m. on Monday through Friday. Go check it out. That's Pagacha's Pub 85 in Kirkland. Our second storyline, the Mariners pitching continues to be as advertised. This is the best rotation in baseball. As a pitching group, they may be the best in baseball. But we're going to focus on one guy, Logan Gilbert. I'll tell you what. For people that are picking Logan Gilbert to go from really good to Cy Young contender in 2024, like Jason Churchill did, like a couple other people did, like Hyphen did, people are doubling down after that first start because, wow. Wow. Yeah, wow is a, is a, pretty, a pretty good way to, to, to describe how that first start went. 
in his he had his cutter which is the first time I've gotten a good television look of that cutter. He had his cutter looking like a, a slider. That's like the kind of effectiveness he had of that pitch. And he broke it out a few times. I mean, even Blowers and Goldie in the booth, booth were, were confusing it with the slider because of how much it was moving. But was it just your eyes tricking you? After one start, through the one time through the rotation that Fangraphs is able to judge all these, all these pitchers, Logan Gilbert had the best cutter in baseball. <laughs> the best. He this is his first regular season game throwing that pitch, and it registered a one sixty stuff plus stuff plus, which is sixty percent better than league average. A hundred is a league average movement profile for that pitch. Sixty percent better than league average. His first time throwing it. I love that pitch. That thing is the, just the way he used it because what Logan Gilbert went into his goal with that pitch was so that he would not would not get hammered so much with his fastball and in turn throw more junk, more slower stuff, pitches that move off the barrel. That's what that pitch exactly does. It's not too junky, but it's junky enough to move off the barrel and not get hit very hard. And man, especially the fact he can get strikeouts on that pitch too was what a combination of pitches that dude has. It's, it's pretty special there. He is the best number three pitcher in baseball in a rotation by far. It's probably not close. Is is there another one close? Number three. I I was even just trying to play out the scenarios in my head. If everybody's healthy in Houston, what you have Verlander, Framber, like Christian Javier versus Logan Gilbert. Javier's had some good years. I think I'm taking Logan Gilbert. I am too. Like you can go to, I don't know, the Dodgers. Toronto. I was gonna say Toronto, maybe. Like like so you have what you have Gosman, you have. Oh, I'm already blanking. Never mind. Okay. Yeah. So maybe not Toronto. I mean, I was going to say like Bassett, Bassett's, Bassett's more the three there, I would say. So I, like, I'd take Logan Gilbert over Chris Bassett. You have the Dodgers, what, Yamamoto, Glasnow, and then... I was like, Bobby Miller, Tyler Glasnow, Walker Bueller, like, like, uh, like Bobby Miller's, he looked pretty good his first start, I'm not going to lie. Logan right now probably has a slight edge on him. Not saying that's a forever yeah. pick, but right now, yeah. Well, yeah, and and Bobby Miller hasn't had the track record Logan Gilbert has. Now, you can argue when Walker Buehler comes back, there's a chance, but Walker Buehler hasn't pitched a full season in, like, in a while. It's been well over a year since he's pitched a full season. So he's going to take some time to have to dial it back in and everything. So for, the, for right now, I think it has to be Logan Gilbert. Like who's like the, I don't know, Max Freed, Spencer Strider. Yeah. The Braves don't really have a true three behind those guys. That's like Logan Gilbert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't see how it can't be Logan Gilbert. I know we're jumping way ahead here, but if the Mariners make the playoffs in the last decade, has there even been a top three like this? If Logan Gilbert continues to pitch like this. Ooh, Mets. Are you Mets thinking De in DeGrom, Harvey, Syndergaard? Yeah, DeGrom, Harvey, Syndergaard. That was a pretty lethal trio. Let's see. What else? It's, the it's Nats had a good two. The uh, the Astros in 19 were pretty oh, good. Oh, that's a good call. Yeah, JV, Granke, Garrett called. Okay, yeah. so maybe those guys. That, but, that, that was a pretty loaded point unit. Point being, it's not a lot. Mm -hmm. The Mariners get into the playoffs this year and ride these three guys, Luis, George, Kirby, Logan Gilbert. Whew, they can go a long way. A very, very long way. The Diamondbacks got to the World Series. That rotation was nowhere close to what this rotation is. So, yeah, we're jumping way ahead here. But Logan Gilbert looks unbelievably impressive through one start. And I'll say this, too. We're talking about the cutter, which he did not give up a hit on in his first start. You talked about it was by stuff the best cutter in baseball already. That wasn't even his primary strikeout pitch in his first outing. Now, he wasn't throwing it as much as some other pitches, but half his strikeouts came on the splitter. So we know at times he can, I mean, we know he has a great fastball. We know last year he possessed a great slider. The splitter's getting results. The cutter's now getting results. Look out. Like, like, like this is a ridiculous, ridiculous arsenal this dude has. And uh, you, so we just tallied his best stuff plus pitch his best strikeout pitch, and I thought his most effective pitch was neither of those two in his first start. I, th I thought it was his slider. He threw his slider a ton. 
And he was even leaving it over the plate too, and they couldn't really hit it that much. He's probably not going to do that too much. Logan's command is not perfect. He's not George Kirby. He's not just going to dot up the corners because that's not the kind of pitch he was. But I thought about it this way because he had a problem early on his career. He would leave like 95-mile-an-hour fastballs, middle-middle. Well, he didn't throw very many middle-middle fastballs. The pitches he left middle-middle were cutters and sliders, pitches that moved, pitches that were harder to barrel up. And it was effective. Like, the, most of his fastballs ended up on the inside corner to righties, outside corner to lefties. That's primarily where his fastballs ended up. But his, I mean, his cutter and his slider leaked out over the plate a little bit. But since those pitches move so much, it's a lot harder to hit those pitches. And it gives you more room for error. I mean, is that not all you could ask for the, all Logan Gilbert especially can ask for is to have the pitches move so much that even though his command's not perfect, it still works out for him in a positive manner. So like there's just so many good things to like. I mean, we're like we're talking three plus off speeds from that from him. Yeah. And and I'm not shocked the slider looked that great. That was his best pitch last year. So it's yeah. carrying over to 2024. See, I like there's there's already a million reasons to be excited about the Mariners rotation, but seeing Logan Gilbert do what he did in his first start, yeah, that was pretty awesome. I do want to give a couple extra shout outs before we wrap up this segment too. You don't need to hear from us that George Kirby looked awesome because George Kirby did what George Kirby always does, aside from walking two guys in the first inning. Like, chalk up that scorecard and put it right in the Baseball Hall of Fame. You may never see him do that again. Yeah, yeah. and But then after that, it was one, like, no one reached second after that. So right. It was he like, was, as, the, as the shirt says, like, what, what, what were the exact words on that shirt? Do yeah, oh, Angry George's Dreamland. Yeah. The, yeah. the Red Sox stepped into his dreamland and got stomped. Yeah, he was he was dominant. And final one before we wrap this segment up. Gabe Spires looked so fucking yeah. good so far. <laughs> yeah. Our guy. He Little is unit, baby. Definitely lethal. Little unit. He's been leaned on these first five games. It doesn't matter. This dude mixes the perfect combination of stuff and command out mm-hmm. of the bullpen and from the left side. How do you hit it? How do you hit it? Oh, by the way, so we were talking about this earlier. I just want to bring this up now that you brought him up. So we have our we had our perfect box that we put that we put Spire in, right? Where I called him the unicorn. Twenty nine percent strikeout rate or higher, five and a half walk rate or lower, fifty five percent or higher ground ball rate over fifty innings pitch. And I I think I had said that oh there's no one else that had done that. And I was sitting here thinking, mm, actually Kershaw. Kershaw has not done that. I actually went and looked, even though I did the stack. I, I did the search on fan graphs. I had to go double check. No, like Kershaw has never done that. Yeah. Clayton it, Kershaw slam dunk hall of famer. One of the four, three best lefties of all time. Maybe the best, depending on who you ask left-handed pitchers of all time. He's never done that in a strikeout era as a, as someone who doesn't walk anyone, he never hit all those benchmarks in a single season. He didn't do that. And I was thinking, okay, who's another all-time great lefty? Oh, Sandy Koufax. Sandy Koufax. It was he had one season where it was close. He had a tw- like a twenty-nine percent strikeout rate, five and a half percent walk rate on the dot, and he did that. Unlike Gabe Spire, he did it in three hundred and thirty innings. So a little bit more volume than Gabe. But they didn't have ground ball rake back then, so I can't confirm that. Like, this is the kind of company we're talking about that Gabe Spire is in. <laughs> and he has entered 2024 looking even better than he's looked in 2023. So, like, if that's even possible, because, again, he had such a good year last year, but he's taken another step forward, at least in the first few outings he's had this year, where, yeah, he's just mowing guys right down. Yeah, it's it is not fair. I mean, a high teams don't really have a high leverage lefty in the bullpen almost ever, unless your name is a Roldis Chapman. Yeah, like you do not have a high level, not anymore with Roldis Chapman, but in the past, a high leverage lefty with like that. And Spire is he's unbelievable. Before we get to hyphen, really fun conversation with Root Sports analyst, former Mariner Ryan Roland Smith. Let's hear a word from Ticket Smarter. Baseball is back, and Ticket Smarter. Has you covered, guys. If you want tickets, we really recommend you listen closely to this right now. They have seats to more than 125,000 live events. Ticket Smarter is the smart choice when you need tickets for concerts, theater shows, and sporting events. Think smarter, think Ticket Smarter. 
Go to TicketSmarter.com or the Ticket Smarter app and use our code Marine10 for $10 off your purchase. That's code Marine10 for $10 off your purchase only at Ticket Smarter. Guys, go get your Mariners tickets. Use our code Marine10 at Ticket Smarter. I love having Ryan Roland Smith on because, uh, like his, he like think of the how short of a turnaround it's been for Ryan Roland Smith from the playing field to the television booth, and he does it just about as well as anybody. Period. In the root sports booth, yeah, he's been awesome up in that booth. Like knowledgeable, like charismatic, knows his stuff. Yeah, like he's he's awesome to listen to. He's got some great stories from his playing career. We get into some of that stuff. And, and this is just a side note, too. But like Hyphen's always like since we started this whole thing, he's always been incredibly supportive of the two of us and, uh, and, and is always helpful with us either at the field or when we have questions for him, everything. So to have him on and actually get to talk with him on an interview was a bunch of fun. He's also talking about his new show that he's starting this year, which sounds like it's going to be awesome he's got some awesome guest book for it already yeah overall really really fun conversation with hyphen and also really fun if you're not like he's australian and there are not very many baseball players from australia and learning about the perspective of baseball and how it's viewed in australia and what the culture is like and how it's evolved over time is i mean it, it's it's pre- some pretty interesting stuff and we dive pretty deep into it with with ryan roland smith so we're not going to keep that from you any longer let's get to our conversation with ryan roland smith all right we've got the hyphen it's ryan roland smith former mariners pitcher now analyst on root sports on seattle sports host of the top step podcast which let's just kick it off right there you've got some exciting stuff in the works with the pod right ryan yes i do i do and look i i can talk about podcasts, shows, all this stuff. I've actually learned a lot the last couple of weeks, but you know, I mean, you guys know you got, you got, you guys are killing it by the way. We'll get to that in a second, but, um, but no, yeah, let's kick it off with that. So basically if you look behind me, I mean, I've got a neon sign. What else do I need to say? I mean, it's pretty legit when you got a neon sign, that's for sure. But um, no, lucky enough, I am doing a, a Mariners weekly show uh, every single week. It's going to start opening day on Root Sports. Uh, it's going to be on YouTube as well. Uh, it's some extra content, talking to players, just like you guys do, uh, talking to former players, some makes teammates, telling stories, um, breaking down the Mariners, some of the top trends. So it's going to be fun, man. I can't wait. I, I had the podcast and that was something I kicked off, you know, around COVID and, uh, you know, went hard. I really enjoyed it. It was more about, as you guys know, it's a great way to connect with players. And that was kind of how it kicked off. And, and uh, it's been a blast, man. So a chance to do this, um, to do it, you know, on Root Sports, which um, part of the Mariners broadcast. I'm really, really excited. So again, uh, like I said, you, you guys know how this stuff goes. It, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky to navigate. Sometimes you, 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 you set out in your head how it's going to be and it's completely different. So we'll see about a couple months in how, how this show looks for sure. Why did putting it on Root Sports make so much sense to you? I think, well, first of all, there's, you know, obviously, as you guys know, you guys do the audio and, and the visual side of things. Um, I love the audio side because it can be long form. I think, uh, n- not to get too deep in the weeds, I think that when you have a chance to have a, a long form conversation, not just sound bites, um, it's really important. So I love that from the audio side. I love that from a sit down interview with someone where it's not rushed. They don't have to give the cliche answers um, and you can really dive in. But then on top of that too, I just think like from... From a visual standpoint, there's so many times where, you know, Cal Rawley uh, talking about his, you know, catching uh, or whatever it may be, um, and you don't quite get to see the 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 visual side of it. So I think you know, doing it on Root Sports and having a show where I can I can get that access to a guy like Cal and go up to the bullpen and have him you know get down and some nice cameras and and see what kind of drills he does. You know, if it helps a kid out or whatever it may be, or you know, why is it so important to do certain things? He might do something in April, May, and you like man, like that, that made a huge difference and having a chance for him to visualize that too as a player, uh, I think it's really important. And on top of that too, as you guys know, and back to the long form part of it, you know, TV, doing a pregame show or doing, you know, sometimes when you're doing a game on, on a broadcast, you, you have to keep it quick. And that's something as we'll learn in the next, you know, 20, 30 minutes, however long we're, we're sitting on here for, uh, I have a tough time getting to the point. And so I think that when you have a chance to do something where I can do a 30 minute show on root sports, but also have the extended version on YouTube, which it will be like, for example, I'm, I'm sitting down with Felix next week uh, at the Mariners warm up event. And 
you know, I want to talk to him for 30 minutes. You know, I mean, he, you know, uh, the guy, I got a chance to play with him when he was at the, at the peak of his career. You can't put that in a 30 minute show. So I can do both, which, which is a, a real, real benefit. And I think that, um, you know, doing both really helps. So uh, that, that was something that was important to me uh, to, to have the ability to do both, have the long form and, and have the, um, the, the more of the visuals too is, is really cool. How are you going to choose which 30 minutes get to go on TV? Well, that's just it, man. It's it's one of those ones where I'm again, I'm hopeless, man. I, like like I said, my, my my answers are long enough. My questions are even you know longer. Like that's the hardest thing. And you, and you guys know this. I'm happy to, to to dive into it. Asking players certain questions, it's way harder than it looks. It, right? Am I right? I mean, you guys know. Yeah, I, I know you guys do such great social content too, where where you ask them, hey, like what your top ten or top five or whatever it may be. It's just so good because you see, get to see the personality of the player, but when you sit and have that, that long conversation, you, you, you feel like, and I'm, you know, look, I, I played, but from a, being a former player, walking in the clubhouse and like, oh man, I don't want to get in anyone's way here. I know what that was like. I'm trying to, you know, get my routine in whatever. And I'm like going to bug him and say, hey man, you got 30 minutes and you want to dive in and, and you want to keep them, um, you know, sort of not captivated, but you want to keep them engaged in what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's an art form. It really is. I'm still, I suck at it. I'm, I'm getting much better at it. Um, but, but that's what like long form gives you the chance to do when you have a chance to, to, to sit down and talk. But then I have someone who's making those decisions on the side. Someone else is deciding what five minutes out of the, the 15 minutes, five minutes, five minutes, whatever, um, they're going to choose. Thank God, because I'd be screwed, man. I'm like, where do I go with this? That's for sure. Well, I was going to ask if you have any bucket list guests for the show, but it sounds like you've got one already checked off with Felix. I mean, you're climbing pretty high up the ladder to start here. Yeah. I think the thing with Felix and I, Here's the, here's the deal. Like, look, I, I, I missed the everyone wearing the 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 yellow King's Court shirts and, and him standing there. I saw photos. I was I think I was back in Australia at that point. You remember that last game he pitched um, at, at T-Mobile? And, you know, a lot of people remember Felix in those last couple of years, which fair enough. I mean, they're the last couple of years he, he pitched. But he just – he look, we all know, man, he wasn't the same as when he was peak Felix. Like, for example, I have Brandon Morrow and Eric O'Flaherty join me on the first episode – and we just, you talk about like trying to, you know, contain a subject. We kept talking about peak Felix. We're talking when he first came up and then, you know, you're talking about five oh six oh seven, And then by, I think by 2009, 2010, man, he was, everything just started to click. Obviously he made a, made a um, all-star team. And then he won the Cy Young in 2010. That was such a dismal year, 2010. It's so hard to pitch well. I'm not making excuses, but when you're around just a terrible environment, which it was, and so we, we got talking about that. And, and so I got I was super lucky to be a teammate of his and watch him just slow down the pace, man. Like you'd go on the, to the East Coast, hostile environment, watching him warm up, and then all of a sudden, whack, base hit, walk, two runners on, and he just slows down. And, and you know, we, we watch some of these young pitchers. I love watching body language. I love watching how guys react. You know, like George Kirby last year, watching him react to certain situations, good and bad. And Felix just had that that presence about him, man. It's it, you can't teach it. That alpha thing about him, where it was so fun to watch. Like you were not walking in the in the in the clubhouse. I'm talking circa 2009, Felix. Like because you just want to watch every moment. And so, yeah, you know, I, I can't wait to sit down with him. And and he seems like he's way more, as you guys have noticed. Like came back and threw out that first pitch in the in the playoff game, and then uh, had you know the Hall of Fame last year. It's nice to see him wanting, wanting to come back. It's a long trek from where he lives. So it'll be fun, man. It'll be good to see him. Ryan, so I love all these ideas you're throwing out here. It sounds like you've just you thought of so much of this ahead and the excited with the idea of getting this on Root Sports and, and, and thinking of all the different ways you can present this. I want to know like when in your playing career you decided that talking about baseball is what you wanted to do after you're done playing. Yeah, like, well, first of all, as everyone knows, I come from Australia, right? Baseball in Australia, no one cares about baseball. You play baseball in Australia, everyone's like, oh, okay, um, you're a professional athlete, whatever. Now, if you're a professional rugby player, dude, yeah, I mean, you're the man, right? And as, as you know, as insecure, as, as, as um, egotistical, whatever the word is, but I'd go home, I'm talking, I was in the big leagues, right? And, you know, I'd go home like, those early years or when I was close to getting the big leagues or I'm getting talked about or, or whatever. And, um, yeah, everyone's like, Oh, you know, have you, I haven't seen you on TV yet. <laughs> so that's, that's my Aussie accent. And I was just like, Oh man, like, what do you have to do around here? Like, I love the game so much. And I'd go back to Australia and just try and be a, the biggest ambassador possible. Cause I wanted to try and grow the game. Right. Um, and then 
it was one of these things where like, when I was going to the US, I'd go into this environment where like, man, all I want to do is talk about the game. I want to be around people who love talking about the game. So like any opportunity I got, and this, it sounds crazy because you guys are watching a generation now where they're all on social, they're joining you guys. You guys ask, ask them crazy questions on your social account and they're willing just to answer them. I'm telling you, you go back to like my generation and, and prior to that, they would have just looked at you like no chance. Like the media was the enemy. When I was playing, I just had this feeling like, like, the reason there's 40 something thousand people on a, in a sellout is because the dudes sitting over here writing the articles are saying good things. That's why people are standing up cheering. Or that's why when I've got a six ERA, people are still have my back. And I just always, I, I just respected and appreciated that. And I don't mean to sound like I'm kissing ass at all, but you know, Rick had a great relationship right out of the gates with Rick Riz, you know, Shannon Drea, some of the people who are still there, all the reporters. I just, I loved it, man. If they wanted to come in and talk about, Australia, talk about me, talk about baseball, talk about anything. I'm just, I'm wide open. I'd sit there and just have the longest chat ever. And so I think when you build those relationships, that helps. Look, and 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 getting into this, and sorry to drag this out, but I think um, I'll get to when I sort of figured out, like, you know, I'd love to do this when I knew the career was starting to have a slow death. But um, I think it's really important, and players need to understand this. I try and tell teenagers this all the time, that relationships and networking, just like you guys do, you guys do such a good job of it. It's so important. It's so important. It doesn't mean you have to kiss everyone's ass. It means have a relationship with someone. Listen to someone when they talk to you. If if a reporter comes in, know their, you know, know what they're into besides writing about the Mariners. It's not this thing where all of a sudden you're a player and you're on this pedestal and everyone has to, you know, tell you how amazing you are. So I always understood that. So I think when I got out of the game and I was freaking out, man. Every player does. I go to these career summits every year. I talk at these MLBPA, the Players Association summits, and you've got like. You know, these former players, I say, I'm like, man, that dude had 10 years in the big leagues. That guy made, you know, $20 million that one year. And they're sitting there and they're just a deer in headlights. They don't know what to do. Like, could they get out of the game? And I think for me, I was lucky. I was like, man, I'd love to get into some form of broadcasting. I didn't think I had a good enough career to do it, to be honest with you guys. Uh, and then I saw some other dudes who had like a similar career to me jump on TV. I was like, oh man, okay, I can do it. Uh, and then I, I got in touch with Kevin Martinez uh, from the Mariners. And he said, hey, come up to Seattle and meet some of these people. And I loved it, man. It was just nice to get back to Seattle. I thought no one would remember me, A, and then B, it was like all the same people were there. And I was like, man, this is what I want to do. This is absolutely what I want to do. If I get a chance to be around the game at this level, you guys know how it is, man. You walk the afternoons on the, right in front of the dugout when you're talking to players, it's the best, right? If I get a chance to do that like as much as I possibly can, I'm all in. So towards the end of my career, I wanted to keep it going as long as I could. I got done with baseball. I'm like, okay, I need to do something which you know, scares the crap out of me. Uh, like it does still and something I can, can strive forward and have some goals. And, and this is it. I love it. Was Seattle always, did you have that circled as wanting to come back to the Pacific Northwest to do this? Well, th there was, there was, uh, where do I start with that? Like throughout the time with the Mariners, I, I, I don't even know how old you guys are. What, what generate, what, what team you sort of jumped on to that you remember your, what, what are your earliest memories, by the way, what team, what year? Probably that era, Ryan, to be honest. I was like nine when you were there, nine, 10, 11, 12, I think I was. So that would have been right in there. I want to say I started a little bit earlier than that. Like, unfortunately, I'd say my first real memory of a full season of Mariners baseball was 04, which is right when a lot of losing started. So I don't really remember 01 or even 02 and 03 when they were right in it. So I'd say right around 04. And like we've talked about before, like I have vivid memories of you doing that Mariners commercial where the guys come up to you. It's like, oh, we want to give you a salute to your homeland tonight, Ryan. And, and they're talking about all these things from Austria. And you're like, you guys know I'm not from Austria, right? And they're like, are you serious? And that like, so I have very vivid memories of 09. Yeah. Hey, listen, man, that, that was some good. And again, same thing, Kevin Martinez, like you got to remember that, like it was, believe it or not, that had those crazy commercials, but it was pulling teeth. Like you go back through that string of commercials, you had to have like a certain veteran player sort of give the head nod if you're a younger player to do them, right? Like, because the media was kind of like the enemy. Like, you don't do any of that crap. You just take care of business, you know, pull your boots up and go out and punch tickets. But I was always like, no, I want to do all this stuff. It's awesome. Um, I loved it. Because again, I came from a place where no one, no one cared about baseball. I was like, this is awesome, man. Like people think I'm cool. And they want to do a silly commercial. Let's do it. But, um, but back to, you know, look, look I was in a kind of a, a funky era, era with the Mariners. That's for sure. And, you know, I signed with them when I was 17 years old. 2001 was my first year playing rookie ball as an 18 year old. Now there was, and maybe, maybe she might be listening. 
Jan Plain. Now I know Jan really well. She used to work for the Mariners. She was like my USA mum, right? So everything I needed from a visa, figuring out hotels, transportation, all that stuff, um, she would do everything, right? So, you know, it, it, I, I kept in touch with her the whole time. So like, I'll be honest with you, I get done playing. My last year pitching the, in, the, in the big leagues was 2014. And then coming back, like Kevin asked me to go up to Seattle. I was like, man, I want to, but like, I don't know anyone up there. I felt like I just didn't know anyone because I had through the peaks and valleys, like some weird, weird times with, um, with the Mariners. So, you know, the, one of the first people I seeked out was Jan. I mean, she, she just, she works for like a lot of the international players. That's what she does. And she was still there and it was awesome. And then I saw her, then I saw this person, then I saw that person. And it's like, oh, it all came back to me. I'm like, this is a nice community. This feels like home. I've been with him pretty much the Mariners my whole adult life by, you know, a few years. So it, it felt that way. I felt like it was a natural fit. And I'll be honest with you too. I didn't have, didn't make a big enough impression anywhere else I went. Uh, I only played in the big leagues with the D-backs beside that. So I'm like, I'm not going to get to Arizona. They're not going to give me a TV gig or a radio gig. I'm going to go to Seattle. That was it. So off that, you talked about you signed with the Mariners at 17 and, and like baseball wasn't that popular in Australia, right? So how did they find you all the way back when, when they signed you? Yeah. So, all right. So when I, late 90s, God, I'm aging myself bad here. Um, late 90s, when um, I was a teenager, it was one of these ones where like you had to be like, you know, top 1%. Like there was like always each age group. Uh, and there was more dudes signing back then. You had to be like the the top five players in the country for your age to get, even get a crack, right? Um, to get to get a chance in there. And you know, I was fifteen, sixteen. Couples, what they do in Australia, by the way, it's it's super cheesy. Um, I don't think they do it anymore, thank God, because it's changed a lot. They used to give you like a business card, right? So like, I never forget. I was how old was I? Uh, I think I was fifteen. Um, yeah, big big left handed dude swung the bat okay through decently hard that you know you don't know when you're 15 so some kids do um but the rocky scout came up and gave my mom a business card and these dudes listen guys like these scout nothing against scouts back in australia but they walk around like they're the gm like they would walk around like they had their like rocky's polo and you know bucket hat and everyone's like oh man the rockies like that's how it was and so he came up and he like you know he gave my mom like a business card and everyone's like oh man and i was like man i kept that card forever and then the 12 months after that, crickets, right? Like I wasn't very good. Everyone was getting bigger than me. I was like, I just wasn't getting any stronger. And then literally last second, man, I was 17 years old. I go to go to nationals. You play for your state, right? So there's six different states to go and play. I go to nationals. I'm throwing like 85s, 86s. And you guys are probably like, yes, yeah, so. But back then it's like I was 16, what was I, 16, 17 years old, just about to turn 17. I started throwing harder. I had this like big breaking ball. And all of a sudden I was on the map. And then I started just like, man, this is, this is close here. Like, cause college wasn't, wasn't an option. Like it just wasn't right. And all of a sudden they had the Olympics in 2000 and they had all these like international scouts out. And then we had this showcase, they put this showcase together and I was hitting bombs. I don't know how crushing bombs. And the, the, the twin scout said, he basically said, and we had to run sixties and all that. Right. And I was, I was just slow. I was running slow, but I was hit. I was like, man, I'm hitting like out of, out of my mind right now. I'd never hit like that. I'm not joking. And so I'm um, hitting, he goes, Hey man, like, you know, nice swing. Howie North said it was, was the scout. Hey, you know, nice swing, but you got a big hole. You get beat up by blah, blah, blah. And again, like I've said, man, these scouts act like they're the, they're the, you know, the, you know what? And so I was like, Oh man. They're like, Hey, they're throwing bullpens over there. Now again, like, like I said, all these scouts I've never seen came to the Olympics in 2000. And so I was like, all right. So I go start throwing a bullpen, not nothing great. And then a scout who I knew right after that, there was some rumblings. He came over and he's like, Hey man, we want to make you an offer. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, 25,000 bucks sign with the Mariners. And I was like, what? I was just like, are you kidding me? Are you joking? And I go, oh, I'm going to think about it. My mom's like, Oh, let, let us, let us think about it. I get drive home two hours and this is going to age me too. Right. I get home and my, my stepdad sitting there goes, Oh, there's some scout on the phone with the, the, the Marooners. No, I'm joking. Now the Mariners, he knew the name. And, uh, and <clears throat> in case he listens, I don't want to throw him under the bus. And he goes, okay, 30, 30 grand. And I was like, yeah, done. <laughs> that was it. I'm like, boom, I signed for 30 Gs and, and I was going the next year. So that was it. That was it. And that's kind of how it happened. It's crazy. Where is Australian baseball culture now? How how much has it grown since then? I, I It's still not, it's probably still not where you would want to see it in terms of funneling Australian baseball players to America more. But where would you say it is right now? And what direction is it going? Yeah, it's a great question. So late nineties really picked up where 
you know, he had access, he started to get access to like, they had the Australian baseball league in the nineties and it shut down. Now they got it back. And so it started to really pick up steam and there wasn't that much competition, right? Like we only had like a couple channels and it was like prime time, like Sunday afternoon, Friday evening, they'd have the Pepsi cup. And that's what kind of that, I was like, Oh, this is awesome. Uh, and then, and around my time, it was like, just, you, you would like Aussies were signing for like a hundred K 200 K to cut, go over. There was no international um, cap, right? Like there is now. And then all of a sudden, that's kind of how it was. It kind of dipped a little bit. And then, um, you know, we had some success. We won, I won a silver medal at the Olympics, and like, with, we thought that was going to be it. All these kids are going to jump on, jump on, and, and you know, they, they, they didn't. Um, and they had, so they put, brought in this international cap. So as you guys know, the, all the Latin countries, you know, the Dominican, Venezuelan, um, you know, all, all those guys, you know, they're the first guys that get those giant signing bonuses. Then some of the Asian players and the scraps go out to the, the Aussies. That's just the way it goes. There's just no money left by the, by the time they get to the Australians. And that kind of really put a damper on kids signing. Kids just, it was so much tougher for kids to get signing professionally. Um, and then 2000, around 2016, that's right when I started, um, like the show I got on Next Gen Baseball, right? So I started this company where I was bringing kids over to the US um, and getting them to go to college. I was like, don't sign professionally unless it's life altering, staggering money. Go to college. Like, and I'm, I'm not... I'm not saying I wasn't trying to be all you know down in the dumps, but I was like, man, like 99% of these kids, they go to play pro ball for three years. They get, go back to Australia. All their buddies are done with school. They're sitting there going, what do I do now? You know, it was tough. So I said, unless you're really ready for pro ball, go play college baseball. So I started getting in, getting kids into schools of um, Travis Bazzani. You guys know, Tra I don't know if you know Travis at Oregon state. Um, he's killing it. He's going to be a top five pick in the draft. He came over um, with next gen baseball, Jimmy Nadi, He's at Stanford. Um, he's another kid who's going to be in the draft next year. Uh, we sent a kid to Columbia, Gonzaga, all the way down to Juco. So I started doing that 2016, obviously COVID made it a little tougher, but I'm back on it this year. I'm bringing a couple uh, groups of kids over. They go to driveline for a week. Um, they go showcase. And I think that from 2016 until now, the amount of kids going to go play college baseball, I think baseball Australia have eased up and, and push more towards the college route, which is great. So the net just widens, they get a chance to mature and everything else. So I think in this next so the state of baseball, I, it's really flatlined. I think in the next, from Travis, the next five years, you're going to see some dudes just like in the NBA where, oh, this guy's Australian. Like when Andrew Bogut was the first, I think he was the first or second pick overall. When that happened, all of a sudden, these other Auss, all these other Aussies who are in college programs started going through the draft. And then all of a sudden, these Australians, like basketball just took off in Australia. I think that's the same thing is going to happen with this next generation. Um, I'm not trying to plug the business, uh, but the next generation of these Aussie kids come through and start getting drafted high for sure. So if Travis makes it and he makes it big, he gets up to the big leagues quickly and he starts crushing it. I think he's projected to go to the guardians first overall, wherever he ends up in the draft this upcoming summer. So if like he makes it big, all the T are the TVs in Australia turned to baseball. Now they go back away from the NBA and they go to watch Travis Bazzano wherever he's playing. I, I think if let's say hypothetically, look, the NBA has a, you know, NBA is huge, like internationally, it's massive, right? Uh, especially in Australia. Um, I, I don't think it'd be, uh, look, uh, when from Bogut onwards, just put it this way, the, on Australian TV, like um, on some of the mainstream channels and stuff, they would show the games, like, like Ben Simmons was playing Bogut, you know, they would show those games. So like if an Aussie was playing on a team, they'd show them. So if it was a situation where like, say, let's say Trav gets, gets the big leagues and he's a superstar, Jimmy Nadi gets the big league superstar. And you know, you mentioned Travis on the, the guardians. So let's say Jimmy's on the, on the pirates, whatever. Well, all of a sudden, if they start showing and profiling these Aussie players, I think it's really going to help. I, re I really do. Um, but it's tough. It, it's, it's, it's always tough. I think that if you can continually see, you know, drafty, 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 and these kids, these Aussie kids, there's, I mean, look, I, it's definitely going to grow. And I think the, the younger kids are going to look at that and go, man, I want to be just like Travis Bazzano as opposed to I want to be like Mike Trout or if they, you know, and here's the other thing too. I talked about the NBA from a, you guys know this, baseball struggles. We talked about this last half decade. There's no like pop culture icon in baseball. You know, the NBA has it, NFL has it, obviously you know, Taylor Swift uh, and her, her boyfriend too. Um, but baseball just doesn't have that right now. They had a little bit of that with Jeter, A-Rod, when A-Rod was dating these celebrities. Baseball needs that. Countries like Australia, they latch onto that. If you had, unless it's, if it's Travis Bazana and he's killing it and kids want to be like that, that's great. If it's an American dude who like is dating some, you know, Uber celebrity couple, and there's a couple of those baseball, will, will, I hate to say it, but that's kind of what you need, honestly, in Australia. So 
you know, that's just the way it goes. Okay, with with baseball not having that like ultra figure like you were talking about, like like how Jeter kind of used to be. Like, do we think Shohei's getting closer to that? Yeah, I, th- I, I do. I think so. Um, I don't like. I think. Well, yeah. I, obviously, when you bring up Otani's name in Australia, it gets more legs than um, like Mike Trout, right? Like you, you talk to a non. And I talk to plenty of non baseball uh, fans. Uh, Mike Trout is a ridiculous professional athlete, like one of the best athletes on the planet. No one in Australia know, knows who he is outside of baseball fans. Otani gets a little bit more, he, he makes a little bit more headway. But again, I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but if you've got someone, da- like it doesn't even have to be Otani, man. I'm talking like if you could be like. Um, the Cole Tucker. Okay. All right. Now, hold on, hold on. No, I'm talking, no, I'm talking about like a, someone who's like, a well-known, like established everyday player who's dating. Um, let, let me come up with one. Um, this might be a good thing you can ask um, the players when you see them at the, the top of the dugout. Um, let, let's try and figure it out. I'm going to say. Just like a, just a regular big leaguer, like not a superstar, but just plays every day. Like, I don't know, like somebody like David Fletcher or somebody like that. I don't know. No, not David Fletcher. Some, okay, let's say like a Bregman level player. Oh, okay. So higher than that. Okay, yeah. Really good player. Like a, like I said, really good established major league player who is dating. I don't even know who these celebrities are anymore. I'm too old, man. Um, who's like, who's like lines up close to Taylor Swift? Uh, Dua Lipa. Let's say Dua Lipa. There you go. You guys are young, man. You, you know. All right, so if Bregman started dating whoever that is, boom. I'm telling you, Bregman jerseys everywhere. Bregman jerseys walking around Westfield Shopping Mall in Manly. You guys have no idea what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying, right? Like, that's the difference. And Otani is like a, a phenom, as we know. But if, look, if Otani was dating, I know he just, like, they just leaked pictures of, he, of his wife. <laughs> it was just, just, just kind of snuck it in, just like. Yeah, I'm married now. I'm watching all these, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing the zombie scroll through social media. I'm seeing your podcast pop up every other second. And then I'm seeing all these other ones. I'm like, everyone's showing highlights of her basketball. Ga- like, it, it's so ridiculous. Like, through ba- through baseball, Twitter, Twitter and Instagram. I love it. But, um, now, like, look, if Otani was dating some celebrity, could you imagine? Like, seriously, that would transcend baseball. It really would. No, you're right about that. And and I will say, like, like no, for everything you're doing with trying to grow the game of baseball in Australia, I think it's really cool. Because, again, like you said, it's like a country that didn't grow up with a lot of it, but you're trying to kind of instill it back into your to your home country, which is cool. Like, And it is growing. Like, I, I, like I, I, I know you were talking about how it's grown, like, and you still want to see more, but it's definitely grown. Like, it's much more prominent in, like, in the WBC now, for example, I'd say. Well, that's just it, man. So, like, the WBC... And he, that's a great example, right? So I, I'm not going to lie. I went and did the WBC over and I was doing the, um, the Taiwanese pool, right? And I kept getting asked by the guys who were covering the Aussie team in Japan, like give us a scouting report. I'm looking down the list. I'm like, man, they're just, they had these guys who they weren't these like young, exciting up and coming players. They had a roster full of dudes who had play, had been seasoned in professional baseball all over the place. Um, but they, they weren't, overwhelmed playing the Tokyo Dome. I played there in 2017, that WBC. It's overwhelming. It really is. And we had a bunch of young dudes. But I'm talking like the WBC. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, so in a couple of years, when's the next one? I should know this. What, 2023? No. Seven. Yeah, so we had 23. So is it every three years? I should know this. Six. No, it'd be, it's going to be before the World Cup. No, it's well, it's every four. That's why I'm saying 27. I think it's 27. I think COVID screwed up the schedule. I think I think it's going to be in 26. Okay, it's going to be every four. I thought they were trying to make it every three or something. No, I don't know. They, they switch, whatever. They switched it. But I, I think the next WBC, you could have these young, like, oh, man, he's a top 10 prospect with, you know, the, the Angels. He's a top 20 prospect. I think you may see that. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, I think you're going to have it just like, you know, infiltrated with all these young prospects who are just on the, on the, on the doorstep. And that's massive. That's really, really cool. If that's the case. Before we get off the Australia topic, because you do this on your podcast, I wanted you to do this on ours as well. Can you give us an Australian word of the day? Oh, Australian Aussie word of the day. Um, well, g- give me, g- give me like a, a, uh, give me a category. Give me, give me some sort of category category. Let's say in reference to, like, let's say movies, something to do with movies. Um, go, to the, go to the flicks. Have you ever heard that? Well, okay. No, I've never heard that. 
So you go to the pictures, right? So like in Australia, like, oh, I'm going to guess, you know, obviously Netflix kind of takes that too. But in Australia, no one's like, oh, you know, I'm going to go see a movie. I'm going to go see a flick. I'm going to go, going to go, like, basically, that's how you would say it in Australia. You're like, oh, I'm, have you seen that flick? You know, like, it's, I guess Netflix says that, right? So that's, that's, not, that's not good enough. We're going to come up with something better. What about an esky? Do you guys know what an esky is? <laughs> no idea. An esky is a cooler. There you go. Boom. So the reason I said that is because I've got one sitting down here. Not full of, not full of um, beer, by the way. I just, it's, just sitting, it's been sitting here for three years. But no, an esky is a cooler. There you go. Boom. Summer's coming. That is good. Get, go, get the, go get the esky. Off you go. How'd that originate? Uh, esky, Eskimo. I, I, maybe a brand? I don't know. That's a great question. I should have Googled it before you asked me that. Because usually if I do an Aussie word of the day, maybe I need to do it on the, on the new version of the top step. But uh, I used to look them up because people used to hit me up and go, oh, do you even know where that originated from? So I had to give, and sometimes I'd butcher it too. Sometimes I'd say, oh, you know, this is, this comes from this. And someone hit me, some Aussie would hit me up and say, that's not true. And I was like, oh no. So yeah, I'll have to find that out. If you've got a computer in front of you, let me know. But it's like, I feel like that could be similar to like us Americans will say, yeah, grab the Yeti. It's the same thing, but Yeti is the brand of the cooler. Yeah, that hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Like the brand, it's got to come from a brand. I'm trying to think. I don't remember any brand when I was a kid, but I guess it must have for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Speaking of your podcast, there's, there's two outings in your big league career. I want to ask you about and one of them kind of ties to your podcast. Cause in the opening it's Rick Riz talking about Rick Riz and Dave Niehaus saying Ryan Roland Smith, no matter what happens here is going to have something to tell his grandkids about, which was your first outing in the big leagues. And you're facing some guy by the name of junior. And then on top of that, you just happen to strike him out and they're talking about, well, Ryan Roland Smith's going to have a story for the rest of his life. So my question is when the day comes that you have grandkids, where's the poster going in their room of you striking out junior? Well, man, see, then it'll just be all these like NFTs. It won't be such thing as posters. Right? Like it'll just be like everyone, by the time my kids have grandkids, hopefully I've got a nine-year-old and a five-year-old. I don't say hopefully in a sense, I want to see a world like this, but everyone will just have like VR glasses and you can just like pull it up, wipe it up and it'll be like enhanced image or something, or it'd just be a video. Sorry, I'm going in the weeds there. Um, but no, dude, like I will say this, like uh, 710 ESPN were gracious enough to get me the, that audio clip. I asked for it and boom, they worked really hard to clip that out for me, which was awesome. Um, and then um, the video too, I was like, oh, I need to get like an HD. I don't think I've lost the HD version i've just got like a grainy version that just watching that I'm, uh, what, that was crazy yeah I, I talked to some of these australians too we had this thing back in australia where everyone brought up their debut and it's just horror stories dude like i, I want to say like 70 percent or now i'd say 60 percent of debuts and, and mind you i think there was like 16 to 2 or something to score when i came in but usually when you have a debut man it's just like it's a september call up <laughs> Games get you get shelled or whatever it may be, but I got super lucky with mine. I really did, and I was so scared going into pitch. But man, I got super lucky. I was just like, "Don't walk this dude. Everyone's gonna hate me if I walk him. Everyone wants to see him hit bombs. Everyone's on their feet, just hoping." I didn't even think anyone realized it was my debut, but everyone just wanted to see him. Just, just me, just to flatten out some curveball, him just crush it to relive their childhood memories. And uh, sure enough, man, like two strikes. I'm like, I'm just going to throw the living crap out of this breaking ball, struck him out. And I, that was it, man. I, I couldn't believe it. it. It was super, super cool. That's for sure. Was that the longest inning warming up you'd ever had? Cause like, I, I remember like that inning, I think the Mariners had given up six runs in that inning and you could, and, and once they tell you to get hot, you're thinking you like, you, I, I don't know if you peeked up at the scoreboard and were like, Oh, well, there's a chance here. <laughs> there's a chance here. I might get to face them. Well, okay. Not many people know this, right? Probably like th three or f like you can look this like you don't have to look it up. But about three weeks prior to that, you know, I, I was actually in the big leagues like th about a month before that, right? So I come up, I get called up, I'm going to the big leagues, right? And and uh, we're playing the Yankees, and the Yankees. I'm talking like this is 07. So you had like you know Jeter, Damon, A Rod, um, Giambi, um, you know all these names. I'm like Matsui. I'm like this is so scary. So I get to T-Mobile or safe at the time. And I'm sitting in the corner of the bullpen just, and I was just praying I didn't have to pitch. And so I went up, this is a Friday night, place is packed. I just feel super self-conscious because I've got this stupid frigging hyphenated name. I'm wearing glasses. I'm sitting in the corner of the bullpen. People are looking at you like you just look like some clown, right? 
and I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking to myself like, oh man, I just don't, I, not now. Like let's wait till the next series or something. I can't remember who we're playing after that. Maybe the Angels or something. I just didn't want to pitch. I just wanted to sit there, like kind of get, get comfortable. And I didn't pitch. We had three days. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday was a day off. I come back in on Tuesday. I get sent back down. So it occurred to me, like it hit me on the drive back to Tacoma. I was like, man, that's going to be my freaking story. I'm going to get called up for three days, never pitch. So I've got no record of it. Um, get sent down and never get back to the big leagues. That's going to be my typical story, right? So I was freaking out. I'm telling you, a good month worth. I was or three weeks. I was like, I just I have to get back to the big leagues. I have to hurry up and pitch. So that game comes along, and I was just like, really, we have to face freaking Griffey coming back, and uh, like coming back to the big leagues. I'm like, uh, can't we just be? Tan-? And we had Boston after that too. The Red Sox just who were just you know killers, right? And so I was like, oh man. And so I was thinking this off the manager just thinks I'm a loser. Uh, Hargrave was the manager. I didn't pitch once in that series. Even though I was up there, I'm like, usually give me a debut, give me a chance to pitch. And then the game's getting out of hand and um, O'Flaherty went in, someone else went in. I'm like, I'm not going to pitch even when 16 is two. I'm like, I'm never going to pitch. Sure enough, the phone rings and I get loose. And finally I get, I get a chance to go in there. But I will say this, man, you had in that lineup, you had the three lefties you had with Josh Hamilton, um, uh, what's his name? The huge dude. Uh, Adam. Yeah. And Griffey. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, the other two, like Adam Dunn, it looks like a monster in the, in the, in the box. Um, Josh Hamilton, MVP. Yeah. Dunn all-star. I'm like anyone, but Griffey, I don't care. Like these other two are just scrubs compared to you. I, I can't face him here. Not right now. And they said, Oh, you're going to have the lefty. I'm like, okay, who is it? And they're like, Oh, it's Griffey. I'm like, no, no, the sacrificial lamb, but it worked out well. But, but um, yeah, man, not many people knew I had for a good month. I had this, like this, epiphany that that's going to be my story when I'm a granddad and tell my kids, yeah, I got to the big leagues. Like, bro, no, you didn't. I don't see any record of it. You know, I had to prove to people I got to the big leagues. You're going to be like, you're a loser. You never pitched the big leagues, but I got there. I finally got there a month later. They would have just pulled up your baseball reference page and just been scrolling. It's like, well, I see triple a, I see like, but I'm clicking on big league numbers. It's just, it's blank or whatever. Had you not, you not gotten in. Exactly. Hey, you have no idea, by the way, or maybe you do. There's so many dudes who play pro ball. And they say, yeah, I played the big leagues. Or like, I, I, you know, I coach a lot of these high school kids too. And they're like, oh, yeah, I coach. You know, he played in the major leagues for so-and-so. And I'll have a quick glance. I'm like, he, he never actually played the major leagues. So he's telling people he played in the big leagues. Or maybe he got called up. Maybe he never pitched or whatever. It's just like, you know, so I was like, I, don't, I can't be that dude, man. If I could get to the big leagues at least once, at least have my name on baseball reference where it has the big capital letters on there. That's for sure. Okay, the second story I wanted to ask you about your playing careers, there's another game you pitched in that at least in Mariner circles is kind of famous because it happened in 09. You're up in Toronto. Maybe you know where I'm going with this. But Matt Tuiasa Sopo hits his first home run in a game that you're pitching in, in Toronto. And it's even more famous because of what Mike Blower said on the pregame before. So my question to you is, like, when in that dugout or in that clubhouse did you guys find out Oh, the team announcer just like time traveled back from the future and gave a perfect prediction of what was going to happen on his home run. Yeah, remember this is pre, this is pre social media. So like, you know, as time went on, I'd go in the. <laughs> sadly enough, I'd go on um, Twitter now X and go look at the comments after I sucked one night and be like, oh god, everyone's just blowing me up. So this is before then. This is 07, right? And so I'm just trying to t- I'm trying to go back to that time because I remember I I, I remember. I remember pitching. I remember, um, I knew who, see, here's the thing, man. Here's the deal. When I first got to the big leagues, I wasn't quite aware of like on the team plane, right? So like, I know I'm going all over the shop here. I'll get to the answer in just a second. But you get on the team plane and you've got the crew, the TV crew get on. I don't know who's who, I no idea, right? I never, never quite knew. I didn't really care. You've got the main announcers and I knew who Mike Blowers was, but he didn't really talk to me that much. Like he, and I'm like, oh, is he, I wonder what he says about me on, on air. Like, if he thinks I'm good, if he thinks I suck, you know. Um, but Rick Riz was always, like, so chatty, man, everywhere. He's like, hey, you know, he knew everything about you. So was Dave Niehaus. They, 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 was, they just took such an interest in what you're up to. And Rick Riz was, like, giggling, like like a little kid, like, like this after the game. And like, oh. And everyone kept talking about it. And then he kept giggling and giggling and carrying on about it. And finally, I said, hey, like, what happened? And I hadn't actually heard it yet. But Rick was telling, he's like, you won't believe this. He predicted what happened. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay, he said, you know, he said, oh, look, he's going to hit a home run. Then I watched the clip. I went, got back home. And I remember watching the clip going, oh, no, no, no. I, I See, I didn't realize till days later that he like predicted everything. It was like, that is super weird. And I'll be honest with you. I'm like, 
like with Blowers at that point in my career, it was like, I knew he was, I knew he was like the color guy. I knew he was in the booth all the time, but I never really knew like kind of what he talked about on X. You don't, you don't get a chance to watch the games. Right. I never really knew what his person, I'm like, is this something he does all the time? Like, is this his thing? Like he predicts stuff, but it was wild, man. I was like, wow, that is creepy. Cause again, like I said, I'm sitting there going, why is this Rick Riz, this, like this dude and him and Dave Newhouse over here giggling about this whole thing. Like he, he probably just called said, Oh, he's going to hit a home run today. Like whatever. But it was more than that. That is for sure. It went crazy. It was nuts. Yeah, he was he was Tony Romo before Tony Romo. Yeah, apparently, apparently. Hey, by the way, Tony Romo is he like the, the he's the dude, right? Like I don't watch enough football, and I really should, but he's amazing, right? In the booth, I, everyone I, I don't hear, and you when you're at that level, like. So I would say his first season, yes, like you're right, because people love that they were getting this like peek behind the door to how a quarterback thinks. The, I would say now people have kind of hopped off that train a little bit because people sometimes think he's winging it a little bit. Like he's he's clearly very smart, but like I think people liked him more during his first year or whatever. And he stopped predicting plays too. Interesting. Yeah, it's funny too when when that works, right? Like someone hops on the scene and everyone they get talked about a bunch because they're brand new. And if people like them, they carry they whatever they're like, oh, we love hearing you, love hearing you. Then all of a sudden they stop talking about them. And then it's something that if you're leaning in too hard to like predicting stuff, like that, it's always good when you can predict stuff. It's great, but um, you know, just just from being in, like being doing that role, if you go overboard, <laughs> it's like all right, okay, you're just having a stab in your fifty percent of the time right now. Let's just ease up a little bit, you know what I mean? For sure. Ryan, if we're gonna wrap it up with a couple of Mariners questions. You, the pitcher, which Mariners pitcher this season are you circling and like, I'm going to watch this guy because he is going to be insane? Um, I think, I well, well, a certain guy who, man, it's a tough one because all these thoughts in my head are going around. Look, if, okay, I think Logan Gilbert is going to be the, the most sturdy guy in the bullpen, the most consistent guy in the bullpen. I think that it's interesting, right? Like for, for the rotation, you, you got two fifths of this rotation, which just unproven. And I don't mean the fact that we haven't seen them. Their, their, their level that they could get to is off the charts. I'm talking about Bryce Miller and Brian Wu. But you're going into the situation where depth wise, you don't have a whole lot of depth. Emerson Hancock, yeah, is sitting there. But like usually you have in spring training, you have maybe someone come in, sign a non roster invitee. The Mariners don't have that. I mean, top 10 of their prospects are all position players too. So you're looking at this guy, man, they're like, they're really going all in on these five guys. So I think the X factor for this rotation of how good this team could be is going to be Bryce Miller and Brian Wu. Now, Brian Wu, I think that has to figure out a consistent way to get lefties out. You notice at the end of the year, he just went straight 70% fastballs against lefties because he just kind of put that change up in the back pocket. He had that for a second. Uh, there was a game against the Yankees middle of the year where he kind of put that pitch in his back pocket. I think he needs some better secondary options against lefties. Um, but man, if he can get that, I think he could be really good. Cause that fastball, man, like, you know, when you're talking approach angle and, and deception and stuff like that, and the way he, th he's so confident with that fastball, he could be really, really good. I mean, really excited to see what he can do. And if he can really get to those secondary pitches from a lefty, but I love Logan Gilbert, man. I just think he's such a good dude. Um, I, that split is filthy. He's got that extension on that, that the, the, you know, top 1% in that extension. So he can just throw fastballs middle of the plate and get away with it. I think he's going to have a monster year and I'm really hoping he's going to be an all-star this year and be that guy who's like pushing 200 innings and being the guy that you're like, Oh, okay. We want Logan game one of the playoffs for sure. I'm glad you brought up Wu because like, I mean, I think everybody's high on this rotation, but I would say like, I'm a very, very high man on Brian Wu just because look, he's going to be on an innings limit, right? Cause he still hasn't thrown that many innings, but just, you just mentioned it. Like, like the, the release point of his fastball, like the fastball rise he has, like just the pure stuff plays up so well. It just feels like he's a guy where like, get him enough work in time. That could be a, like another truly dominant, dominant arm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's what I'm talking about. I think that like he, the, 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 okay. The glass half full answer to that, to Brian Wu and talking about him and you mentioned the fastball, right? When you can go for a good, good stack of like starts and look, the scouting report always builds amounts. So like if you were going to go against lefties and you're going to go fastball heavy, 70%, the K, I think it was like 6% change up or something by the end of the year, barely even through it. And then now the 6% dropped even lower to that. And then he went, okay, I'm going to throw that. I'm really comfortable with that breaking ball against lefties. That, that's fine. But you just have to give that uh, that that extra look to lefties. And I think that change up, man, is such an equalizer. So 
I, I think that the, watching him go about his business, the way he talks, his demeanor, you have that feeling like, okay, I have a little bit of a weak link here. I'm going to absolutely go and crush it. I haven't heard him talk too much about it in spring training, about facing lefties. I mean, it's not like he's sitting there going, oh, I'm going to figure it out. I get all that. But man, if he can get that, because if he can get that change up over or some other secondary pitch against lefties, man, like you talk about like, um, and you want to talk about workload too. If you are going to go fastball heavy and go two pitch dominant um, against you know one side of the plate and they start stacking five lefties and you start having these six, seven pitch at bats, like we saw that, you know, George Kirby, when George Kirby wasn't getting that same, um, that same uh, command on the inner part of the plate, pitch count went through the roof, the workload goes up. So I think all those things, you know, start, start to compound. So with, with a Brian Wu, if he can figure out a, 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 a weapon when he's 2-0 to lefties, get a quick out here and there, um, put that extra thought in their head, then all of a sudden he can be a little bit more efficient, and then you can start pushing a little bit more on that innings limit. I think he could be really great this year for sure. Okay, Ryan, so as we start to kind of wrap this up, uh, is it fair to say that, like, with what the Mariners had to work with, like the off season they had was pretty impressive in terms of what Jerry and, and Justin would be, were able to do. Yeah, I think, look, it was grim in the beginning. Cause I'm looking like, okay, if you can't wheel and deal here, if you can't make some of these trades, cause you kind of knew that, yeah, league wide, it was going to be interesting how people spend money. And we saw that. Hey, by the way, anytime you see a handful of Boris clients going for underneath ask, way underneath asking price, you know, you've got some serious issues if you're a free agent. So I'm looking at that thinking to myself, and obviously Blake Snell just signed with the, you know, signed with the Giants, but watching that process and, and hanging and, and spending some time with him is crazy. So I'm looking at this going, where do the Mariners fit into this? So you kind of knew that it was going to be like that. And then you kind of knew that, you know, with Justin Holland being the, 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 the GM, this is second winter, having a wheel and deal, obviously with Jerry DePoto as well. Um, I think... I think they did a really good job because, again, health-wise, right? Like you had what, like Mitch Hanniger, Garver, and Polanco. Each of those guys like 60, 80 games last year. If you can pull a good four months out of those three guys, health-wise, I know they're on the other side of 30, but I think that the lineup, man, you got Ty France hitting eighth. In, the, in a healthy lineup, man, this is really good. It's really efficient. It's, t- it's one of these ones where – if you can have these set five, six, seven pitch at bats in the middle and then um, get, get a mistake, it's so tough to pitch against. The lineup's better than last year. They didn't have to give up any of the pitching. We all know that. I think it, they've done a really good job. And I, the other thing I like too about it is the fact that they're going in kind of under the radar. I do like that for whatever reason. It's, uh, I don't know if it's a mental thing, but for this crop of players at their age, I think that if you put way too many expectations on some of the unknowns, I talked about two fifths of the the rotation. If you put these crazy expectations on them out of the gates, it can be tough. You get into that first three or four weeks of the season, you're looking around and you start to rub each other the wrong way in the clubhouse. The fact that the the expectations are a little bit more under the radar this time, and you know Mitch Hanniger has been way more vocal uh, this spring training. You got some dudes like Mitch Garver was in the World Series last year. I just think that helps out. It gives them a little bit of breathing room in April, May to, to find their footing, especially from an offense standpoint. Um, so I think they're in a really, really good spot. Um, again, you know, finish a sentence. Everyone has to stay healthy. But I, I think that what, for what they got, man, it's, it's, it's pretty good. And, and speaking of, too, you know, look, the Twins were in a situation with Polanco. They're, like, waving the wire. We all know, right? Like, stuff that went on around, you know, TV money all around the league. Um, they're basically – I talked to friends with the Twins, and they said, look, we would love to have kept him. The Mariners just pounded him for a good year plus on Polanco. They kept calling him. And finally, they just said, look, yeah, we can't, we can't retain this guy. We've got no money to spend. We don't, we're in a situation where we're a little bit strapped. You take him. They didn't have to give up a whole lot for him. I think he's going to be a, a big piece to this as well. Well, Hyphen, this has been awesome. We appreciate all the time you gave us. We enjoyed talking ball with you. We're certainly excited to see the new podcast kick off on Root Sports. And we certainly hope to do this again soon because this has been a blast. Been fun, fellas. I know I'm going to see you at the front of the dugout asking all those crazy questions. But hey, anytime, man, I'd love to join you guys. And you have to jump on the top step as well. Hope you enjoyed the conversation with Ryan Roland Smith. He is the man. Go check out the Top Step podcast. Listen to him on Root Sports and on Seattle Sports when he's on. He'll be on throughout the year. He does an awesome job. With that, 
That'll just about wrap up this edition of the Marine Layer Podcast. You guys know the drill. If you want to listen to the full form podcast, make sure to download our episodes. Leave us a five star review, rate and review. That's all over on the audio side. Like, comment, subscribe over on YouTube, and then go check us out all across social media. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube Shorts at Marine Layer Pod. That's TJ. I'm Lyle. As always, we thank you guys for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.